it from last time, and then I'm going to, to pass the arbitrary fields. So the loose end is really the, the key theorem of the subject, which I really need to mention. This is the following. So if x is smooth, projective, minimal, and rational, then x is one of the following. P2 P1 cross P1 or Fn. This is usually called the Hertzebrook surface. And so this is the pr projective bundle And to avoid double counting, I'm going to assume that n is not equal to 0. And to avoid false statements, I'm going to assume that n is not equal to 1. So we have n greater than or equal to 2. So these are all the minimal surfaces over an algebraically closed field. Now, <coughs> I have to confess, as a student, I sort of took this as gospel. And I never really thought about why it's true. And I. To prove why it's true would take me the rest of the week. So you're not going to learn why it's true today, except in, in sort of a schematic sense, which is probably good enough to get most of you started. So what's the key ingredient here? So if you have a, a rational surface, it follows that the canonical class is not an F. In other words, there exists a curve C This is good because the games that we were playing in the last lecture, where we would identify extremal rays, contract them, and get simpler surfaces, we can't play that game if we don't have some negativity. And so this is what allows us to, so this allows us to play, so play extreme games, extremal ray game. Now, the key ingredient, I'm going to assume this for the time being. I'll say a little bit more about how to think about it. But so assuming this, let's let R be an extreme array. So this is extreme in the sense of convex geometry with Kx are negative. So we have on the other hand, our minimality assumption implies that R squared has to be greater than or equal to zero because it's not a minus one curve. So then <coughs> we use our classification result of the extremal contractions. So we get the contraction associated with R, which takes x to some y. And there are two possibilities. So the first possibility is that this is a P1 bundle. And y is a curve. Or this is just P2. And y is a point. So if we have a P1 bundle, then the, 
In the first case, so we get the, the Fn's for n equals 0, 2, 3, etc. And in the second case, we get P2. So, so this is the outline. Uh, it uses the analysis of the extremal contractions that we sketched out last time. So let me come back to the key ingredient now. So, so, so how should we think about the key ingredient? So I, I really mean this sort of rhetorically. <coughs> so the, the real key necessary concept behind this is abundance. And so let me give you a sample statement of what we mean by abundance. I think abundance, the, the term is, is kind of a joke. I'm not, I don't know the history, I'm too young. But ample means you have a lot of sections. Abundant is a little bit weaker than ample. It means you have sections, they're prevalent, but abundant sections are fewer than ample sections. So you should see this as in some sense a weakening of, of, of ampleness. And so the statement is that if x is a smooth protective surface with kx nap, then
just ready. Sorry for the interruption. No, that's fine. X is minimal. If any birational morphism over K, from X to Y, where Y is smooth, If any such birational morphism is an isomorph isomorphism. <coughs> the main result is X is minimal. Remember, x, if, if x is over an algebraically closed field, it's minimal if and only if it has no minus 1 curves. Here, we need to account for the action of the Galois group. We need to say that x emits no Galois invariant collection. E1 through ER of pairwise disjoint minus one curves. And I guess I should, one bit of notation while I'm at it. I'm going to tend to use gamma for the Galois group. So the picture is, if you have a collection of minus one curves that are per permuted and conjugated by the Gao action, I can try to just blow them all down together. So let me say something about why this is true. I guess I should say it like that, yes. So I, I want to think of these as minus one curves on X bar. So let's suppose that X is not minimal. <coughs> so I have my contraction. Now we know that X bar admits a, a minus one curve contracted by phi. And so let's let E1 to ER be the corresponding Galois orbit. So these are all the conjugate minus one curves. You should think that the minus one curves are the parameterized by some variety, which is defined over k. And so the Galois action permutes the points of that variety. So the, I mean, you can think of the, another way more concretely, is you can think of these as being defined by some equations. And I just let the Galois group act on the equations. It takes one minus one curve to another. <coughs> now, let's look at for two of these, let's look at the. Why is the orbit finite? Well, because I mean the the minus one curves are 
defined over some finite extension. If they weren't, if they were defined over some transcendental, transcendental extension, they'd be deforming in families. The rigidity of the minus one curves, there's only a f going to be a finite number of them, means that they're defined over some finite extension. Yes? Uh, being an isomorphism is stable under, under base change. If you have a morphism, it, if it becomes an isomorphism after base change, then it was an isomorphism in the first place. So I, I, that's a fact that I don't think I want to try to prove you here. Don't even need that you don't prove because they are defined over the algebraic closure of K. They are defined over an extension. They are, yes, they are defined over. There's lots of ways of seeing that, although I, I don't want to, basic descent facts are not one of the courses, unfortunately. So I, I, I can't say much more about that. So we have this orbit. Oh, I should say, and these are all contracted. So this is a quick and dirty way to see that there are only a finite number of them, right? Because there's only a finite number of curves that are contracted by the morphism. So the finite in this, in this case is, is extremely easy. <coughs> so if I have two distinct elements here, I can look at the intersections, and I see This is negative definite, right? So whenever you have a, a blow up, the exceptional locus it has a negative definite intersection form. So I get that minus 1 squared minus the self-intersection is less than 0, which for it is the curves to be destroyed. <coughs> so let's come back to Oh, that was probably, I'll probably never, oh well. Um, <coughs> so for the other implication, let's see, which one? I'm sorry, I need to. Is that what? No, it works as an intersection matrix. I think why you're calling all the other ones. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry. The, the determinant of a negative definite 2 by 2 matrix is positive. Two negative eigenvalues. Yes. So this, this gives me that this is necessarily 0. So <coughs> on the other hand, let's say that we're given even so ER, Galois orbit of distinct destroyed minus one curves. So let's let H be ample on X and define over k, and note that h intersected with each of the components, these intersections are the same for all i and j. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to consider just in a, like with Ovo theorem, I want to consider this line bundle. And because these coefficients are the same, well, this is certainly element of pick x bar, but it's Galois invariant. So the ga is there a question? OK. So.
we know that the Picard group of x is the kernel of the map from the Picard group of x bar. Well, thanks to Andrew, I can use the Brouwer group, right? He told you about the Brouwer group. So we know that <coughs> the Picard group of the variety is the kernel of the map from the invariant part of the Picard group to the Galois group. So let me at least reduce this to a spectral sequence for those of you who are so inclined. So you should think of this as being the map from H0 Galois cohomology to H2 and this is H1 of OX star. <coughs> and this, of course, here is this K bar star. So this is a Brouwer group. Now, the one thing I want to emphasize about this is that the Brouwer group is a, tor is a torsion group. So in particular, it follows that n times h is contained in pick of x. for some n sufficiently large. And so this use, I just take the contraction of the sections of multiples. And this gives me a variety defined over little k that on which all of these things are contracted. And the proof that worked in the algebraically closed field also works to show that this is a blow up. So, so this is the argument. I'm sorry? Oh, that's pretty terrible, yeah. Too many gammas running around. There. OK. So, so we have this result. <coughs> what I'd like to turn to now is how do we actually classify these things? So I'm erasing our old classification theorem because I want to replace it with a new one. <coughs> I want to classify <coughs> all the minimal Sur rational surfaces. To do this, I need to introduce a new class of surfaces called conic bundles. So these are surfaces that we didn't have to worry about in the algebraically closed case, but they play a very important role in the non-closed theory. A conic bundle consists of a minimal surface x. So there's a minimal projective 
rational smooth surface. <coughs> and the dominant morphism f from x to c, where c is a isomorphic to p1 over the algebraic closure. C might not be p1 over the ground field. It might be some more complicated conic, but it's geometrically p1. So that the generic fiber F has a property that F over K bar is isomorphic to P1. So, for example, I could let <coughs> C This is, this is the empty conic, the, you know, corresponding to the quaternion algebra. And I could take x to c cross c. So non closed fields, you have lots of weird stuff going on like this. So this is an example of a conic bundle. And I mean, whatever else we do, we don't want to have to classify conics here. That's, that's An Andrew Kresch's domain. So we're not going to try to analyze what all the possible conics are. We're going <coughs> to assume that someone else knows how to analyze that stuff. And we're just going to express our geometric results in terms of these conics. OK, let's see. Maybe I won't erase that. So. <coughs> Oops. Give some description of the degenerate fibers. Ah, before I do that, let me make a remark. I should have made this remark before, um, but it's now is also a good time to mention it. So if if our field is algebraically closed, then the ten Lang theorem guarantees a section S from C, which in this case is isomorphic to P1, to X. So we, we always have a section of a conic bundle. So this implies, so since, uh, since x is minimal, we necessarily have that x is a projectivization of a vector bundle. which is necessarily isomorphic to the projectivization of the split bundle by, by the classification. So um, a priori is a rational section, but the, the morphism is, uh, is proper. So the valuative criterion allows you to extend the rational section to a regular section. So when you're working over a function field of a curve, the value of criterion allows you to identify rational sections with regular sections, provided the morphism is proper. <coughs> so the, this is why 
We don't care about conic bundles. So in fact, so we, we're, we're, we only care about conic bundles without sections. The second thing I want to emphasize is that every conic bundle has a bisection. This is why they're called conic bundles and not rational curve bundles, in some sense. So if I have a conic bundle, I can always find a bisection. Well, that was a rather poor choice of figure. <coughs> Let me try again. If I have a conic bundle, I can always produce something that intersects each fiber twice. The reason is that if I look at the relative canonical class, This intersects each fiber, well, minus this, intersects each fiber in degree two. And you, you can, by suitably localizing the base, you can always find a bisection. So this may not have a, may not be effective, but if you shrink enough, it will eventually be effective. Another way of saying it is that you just restrict to the generic point of C, and every rational curve, smooth rational curve over a field, is isomorphic to a conic over that field. Uh, yes, I do mean that. Thank you. So let me classify the singular fibers. The minimality puts very strong constraints on the singularities of the fibers. So let's identify what these are. So this is uh, the singularity classification. So the first part, oh, you should see the singularity classification part of the justification for the terminology. I'll show that all the fibers are actually conics. Um, <coughs> so. Given an iconic bundle, so any singular fiber consists of two minus one curves. meeting at one point. So I have the smooth fibers. The singular fibers <coughs> really just look like degenerate conics in the plane. The second part of this I'm not going to talk about much, at least not talk about the proof, but it's morally important, so let me state it. So in fact, we have an embedding So I have x over c, and then 
I want to look at the projectivization. of the dual to the relative dualizing sheaf. So here, omega f is just O of k of f. I have an embedding from x of x into here over c. This is a P2 bundle. And here, the fibers are realized point by point as, as plane conics. So this is, I think, the full justification for why conic bundles are conic bundles. I mean, why they're called that. Yeah, well, we knew that, I mean, and there are conic bundles that are minimal. I could just take a product of a conic with C, and that's going to be minimal. Yeah, you have to have a singular fiber to be non-minimal. No, I'm not saying <coughs> any singular fiber that might occur will look like this, but there's no guarantee that there are any singular fibers. OK. So, Let's see. Push this up. Is there another question? Okay. So Here's a, sorry about that. Hopefully it'll just go away. So let's let F be a singular fiber. The one thing that we know is that if I look at the corresponding F bar, an x bar, this is not minimal anymore, just because of what, I don't know the name, but whoever asked that question, that's exactly what I'm doing here. This is not minimal, and so we have a minus one curve in f bar. <coughs> so let's look at the corresponding Galois orbit. So a lot of stuff can't happen. So let me draw a whole bunch of pictures. Well, the first thing is, is that they're not disjoint. We know they're not disjoint. Now, here are a whole bunch of impossibilities. Impossible cases. I can't have, say, three, three curves meeting once, right? Because of the genus. Ditto for four curves. I can't have two curves meeting twice. These are all impossible cases because the fibers have genus one, a genus zero. So these are not allowed. So what's left? What, what, what can we realistically have? So the only possibility is that r is equal to 2 
and the, the two corresponding components meet at one point. Okay? So there might be other garbage, right, that other than those two key components. How do we show that there isn't any other garbage that we don't want? So here's the idea. So let's let e, e1 to e n be all the components. of f. And let's write the fiber as a sum. So mj is the multiplicity of ej in the fiber. Now, the intersection form Well, I can think of it as living on the direct sum of all the components, right? You give me two components, I can intersect them. But the one thing that you have to remember is that the fiber moves away, right? The fiber isn't stuck there. I can move the fiber to the right a little bit. I mean the scheme theoretic fiber. Since it's a vibration, the fiber moves. So we know that <coughs> f intersected with each of these is equal to zero. So really, I should think of the intersection form as not living here, but living on this quotient. Because, I, I mean, the fiber itself doesn't really play any role here. And then, on this quotient, we get that the intersection form is negative definite. So <coughs> the only places where it vanishes on f is uh, on the, uh, the only place it vanishes here is on f. OK. Well, let's come back here. What is this? Zero, right? Minus one, minus one, plus one, plus one. So we, we get zero for this fiber. So it follows that <coughs> from this analysis is that the fiber is just equal to E1 plus E2. There can't be anything else because anything that goes to zero under the intersection form, it has to be in the kernel of this quotient, therefore proportional to the fiber. I guess I proved that it's proportional to the fiber, but the constant of proportionality is one. So coming, let's see. Let me um, just make precise the description of all conic bundles over, over the algebraic closure. So, so a minimal conic bundle X is geometrically um, the blow up 
of some surface Fn at points in distinct fibers. So I have a, a map from X to Fn. I'm taking some points here and just blowing them up. get the conic bundle. So here I have my exceptional curves. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know how to draw a picture of X. And <laughs> I'm sorry? Oh yeah, so so here P I wish I could work in three dimensions here, but the the things down here are, are meant to be the, the, the fibration structures. Yeah, so distinct fibers with respect to F from X to C. Okay, well let me let me Why is x bar non-minimal? Well, if I have a minus, I'm a little confused. If you have a minus one curve, it's not minimal over the algebraic closure. Yes. Because we had the classification of minimal rational surfaces over an algebraically closed field at the beginning of lecture, I'm using that implicitly. Okay. So I know that if the, if you, I know what the fibers look like in those. Okay? okay? So I'm, I'm using the fact that, yeah. I'm using, I'm making reference to the result at the beginning. Yes? I can't hear you, I'm sorry. You have to speak louder. I use, <coughs> let's see. So you're saying that I don't know that it's. Yeah, why is it not intersected? Well, because it's not There might be those too, but I don't want to worry about those. I mean, I'm not saying that. How, why does it contain any points? We, you're saying why does it contain any vertical minus one curves? So I can take the, I need to, to probably keep track a little bit more precisely of the minimal models, but I can do the minimal model in such a way that I preserve the map onto P1. I have a little bit of freedom as to how I take the minimal models of the rational surfaces when I have a map onto P1. And so I should probably take into account that freedom. So I, you're right, there's a, there's a detail there. If I, had a, if I had been more precise about exactly how I do the process, I could prove that it, I can do it compatibly with the morphism onto P1 so as to pr preserve the structure of that morphism, provided I have con some, con the fibers are, are rational curves. So if I'm more precise in the description, I can get around that. There's some freedom in minimal models that I can use to, to control that. So I, that's an excellent point, and so I, yeah. So this is something I don't, this is one of those things that, yeah. Okay. So, so, what is the condition of the Galois Well, the thing I know here is that these are conjugated under the Galois action. The Galois action is going to spin these two things around. It's going to okay. flip these. It could also flip things this way, too. Well, they're, they're definitely not going to be defined over the ground field. I mean, the one thing you can say for sure is that these, 
that these two things are Galois conjugated, these exceptional curves. So if you look at the action of the Galois group on the configuration of all the exceptional curves, you, you have to have one to take one from the other. Because if, if this were fixed under the Galois action, then I could blow it down. I need to state, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm sorry, the connected, I was looking at, here I'm analyzing all irreducible components of F. Oh yeah, uh, certainly you could have, I mean, because these, th these points here may not be defined over the ground field. Mm -hmm. so, right, so when you look at that Galois orbit there, it's going to break up into a union, a disjoint, a union that's disjoint. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I want to take, I want to pass to the subgroup of the Galois group that's fixing the fiber. Ah. Fixing, so I, I, I pass to a field extension so that the fiber is actually well defined. Okay. And then I an analyze the Galois action over that extension. So I mean, I need the, the fiber to be defined over my ground field to do the analysis. So I pass to that base extension and look at that Galois action. And I'm going to have to cut short questions because I have something I need to state before the end of the lecture. And it's, this is the last point where I'm going to be able to do it. So here's the big theorem. So I'm going to write down all of the minimal rational surfaces. Every number theorist should know this list. If you want to study rational points on smooth surfaces, there's no good reason not to study one of the surfaces on this list, right? I mean, if you study other surfaces, you're not, you're not going to be sure that you're not doing something someone else has done already. So here's a list. Let's say x is minimal. And um, x bar is rational. And as smooth <coughs> projective surface. <coughs> so then, so then either x is p2. X and P3 is a, is a quadric. So that the pick of X is isomorphic to Z. So X is del Pezzo with the pick of X generated by the canonical class. Notice that this excludes this, right? Because here the pig of X is not generated by the canonical class. This, however, does include a Brouwer Severi surface. So these are, I mean, these cases are, are, are actually carefully constructed. Or X is a conic bundle. With Picard group isomorphic to Z cross Z. <coughs> Over Q, the Picard group will be generated by the canonical class and the class of a fiber. So, so these are all of the surfaces that you'll ever want to see. Now, there's some warning that I should provide to you. So here's uh, so. There are coincidences between these surfaces. 
are some coincidences. So you can relate these. If you have a, there may be some birational connections between these. Um, but every surface is, is a blow up of one of these surfaces. So if you want to understand rational points in every rational surface in existence, it suffices to understand rational points on these short list of surfaces. So here's a, a challenge problem. so that you can get a sense of what goes into this theorem. Let's say I have x with the property that x bar is a blow up of p2 at nine points. Why can't x be minimal. I just, just think about it. Take, I mean, take, take the first case that's not covered by the classification and try to understand how you can shoehorn it into one of these four classes. So I, I, I so this, and this in some sense is showing what, what you're dealing with. You somehow have to produce some collection of minus one curves permuted under the Galois action so that pairwise disjoint so that you can blow them down. Now the thing that makes your life a little bit easier is we have really a lot of minus one curves here. Remember, this is the, our bad example where we have minus one curves everywhere. You know, if a given minus one curve doesn't work, there's always more to try. Uh, so, so there's, and it's also not quite clear what are the simplest and what are the hardest minus one curves to work with. I, I just wanted to point this out. This is a good sense of what's involved in the proof of this theorem. Last thing I want to mention is I want to compute something. I think it's really cool and isn't in a lot of textbooks. So in the 30 seconds I have, I think, I want to just do a computation. So here, the really interesting part of the Bricard group is the orthogonal complement to k of x and f. So I want to compute that and pick x bar using the picture. So I, I want to do it now because I have this picture on the board. And if it's gone, I'll have to write it again. So here's the generators. We have row one. I'm sorry, this is E1 minus E2 all the way up to E R minus 1. And when I compute the intersection matrix, I get something like this. Does anyone recognize this matrix? The yeah, it's a DR root system. So this is a DR root system. So. This, this, is, this is a neat fact that it helps to explain what the structure of the Galois representations will look like. All right, thank you for your patience. <laughs>